Hi everyone, I'm Ashley Babel with Midwest Laboratories. We're going to take a look at some of our example soil test results. We have nine soil test results that come from Western Iowa, Central Iowa, Eastern Nebraska, Northeast Nebraska, Western Nebraska, and a few from Eastern South Dakota. We have a wide variety of soils with different textures, different pH values, different fertility levels, etc. We get the opportunity to look at a wide range of different samples. You might stop and say, well, these samples aren't close to where I farm. Maybe your farm is in Indiana, Illinois, Montana, or even Colorado. Stick with me and I think you will um, find some of this information to be very valuable. The numbers may be a little different, but the way to go about interpreting the results, I think is going to be very similar and very applicable. When I look at soil samples for the first time, cation exchange capacity is a good starting point to evaluate the soil's physical characteristics and potential nutrient holding capacity. Cation exchange capacity, or CEC, which it's also referred to, is a measurement of the exchange sites on the soil. It's a negatively charged exchange site that holds cations. These cations that we reference in the soil specifically include potassium, magnesium, calcium, and sodium. In order to get a CEC value, Midwest Laboratories uses a neutral ammonium acetate extraction to bring out the cations, and then we measure those on an instrument. There is then an adjustment made for the molecular weight and the charge or valence of those cations. We also look at the amount of hydrogen coming off of the pH and the hydrogen percentage on the right side of the report. Typically, as pH goes down, the amount of hydrogen goes up. Adversely, if the pH goes up, the hydrogen goes down. It all goes together to calculate the cation exchange capacity. In general, the lower the CEC, the less nutrients in water a particular soil will hold on to. The higher the CEC, the more nutrients and the more water a soil will hold. CEC is very closely related to the texture of the soil. The higher the CEC, the more clay is in the soil. On the flip side, the lower the CEC, the less clay and often more sand is in that soil. When you think of soil texture in regard to sand, silt, and clay, very low CECs, like this find we see in the sample from Northeast Nebraska, it likely has a higher sand content. Our highest reported CEC comes from the sample from Western Iowa with a cation exchange capacity of nearly 25. It contains more clay in it than the others. It is probably a silty clay loam type soil and will hold quite a bit more water and nutrients than the sandy soil we see from Northeast Nebraska with the CEC of five. As you think about CEC, you wanna understand the difference as you go across the field to see if there are areas that should be managed differently. As I look at these lighter soils, which refers to a sandy soil or AKA low CEC soil, I know that it's going to hold less water. And if I were managing irrigation on a field that had this range of cation exchange capacities, I know this area of low CEC is going to hold less water. The plants in this area are going to wilt much faster. And as I look at managing the irrigation for the field, I wouldn't want to turn the pivot on when I see these plants in that areas start wilting because in doing so, I'm probably going to apply too much water in this area and potentially have issues with the field drowning out or lack of oxygen to the roots. We think about water holding capacity in CEC a lot, but also the nutrient holding capacity and the ability of the soil to supply nutrients beyond what we'll see in the analysis that we look at. A heavier soil will hold more nutrients and be able to supply more nutrients than a lighter soil. It's also going to have a likelihood of nutrients that we do apply being tied up in the soil and be less available to the crop. As you look at the CEC of nearly 25, there's probably more nutrients in the soil, but they're also more likely to be tied up. Of course, we're going to look at phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, the micronutrients, to see what those nutrient levels really are. Some things to take into consideration are how the nutrients that we do apply in addition to what the soil can supply and how they're going to behave in that soil. We need to think about the CEC and how tie up versus available nutrients might be affected by that soil texture. After looking at CEC for a little bit and getting a good feel for 
where things are at and um, how to go about managing that particular soil. Here in the Midwest, around Nebraska and Iowa, we get a lot of CECs between that 15 and 25. We can also see some outliers quite often when dealing with a particular field. It might have a CEC range mainly between that 12 and 17, but have an outlier with a CEC of 25. It's an area for some reason that has a lot of clay in it, or maybe we're dealing with a soil that has a CEC range of 15 to 22, but I'll have an outlier that's si sitting around that four or five. And with a lot of that time, it will tell me what I should do is maybe pull up an NRCS map and see if I can understand from the soil survey what is the difference I'm looking at and understand how big that area is. It's a nice indicator of additional management practices that you may want to implement on that field based off of where you see the variations in cation exchange capacities. To move over to organic matter. Organic matter by definition is matter composed of organic compounds that have come from either feces or remains of organisms such as plants and animals. As with CEC, we're still on the same line of thought with organic matter. What is the soil's ability to supply nutrients, and how much am I going to have to supplement the soil's natural ability to hold and supply nutrients with applied fertilizers? Organic matter will supply some nitrogen, sulfur, and a lot of micronutrients. These can be supplied by the breakdown or mineral mineralization of organic matter. We look at current levels throughout the samples submitted. We consider a variety of things. Is there a big variation of levels in the soil? How much organic matter do I have? Do I expect organic matter to mineralize throughout the growing season? An example of mineralization from organic matter would be the mineralization of organic nitrogen to nitrate nitrogen. At Midwest Laboratories, we credit nitrogen 10 pounds for every percent organic matter on the soil test. This assumption for mineralization of organic nitrogen to nitrate is an industry standard number. In any given year, pending weather events, there may be more or less nitrogen mineralized than the given 10 pounds per percent of organic matter found. But regardless, an organic matter percentage of 0.9 is going to release quite a bit less nitrogen than an organic matter of 3.7. The adjustment would be 10 pounds for the 0.9 and 40 pounds for the 3.7% organic matter. With some other things to consider in terms of organic matter, are the workability of the soil structure beyond its texture? Is the water going to infiltrate well? The soil health and the biology of the soil can be related to organic matter and reliant on sufficient moisture. Sometimes we'll see very high organic matter in soils that aren't that healthy. Maybe there's poor aeration, so the organic matter does not break down very readily or even at all. Over time, that organic matter builds with crop residues that are added and you'll get some higher organic matters. But the soil is very wet, plants don't grow well, etc. So there are some additional challenges that the numbers from the soil test give you to think about for that soil. As we look across these soils here, going back to CEC, we see some consistency between 15 and 25, with the outlier of 25 and another outlier at six. Between 15 and 20 is going to catch a lot of the soils, um, but I've got a couple that are certainly outliers, and if this were all in the same field, which of course they're not, then on the organic matter, there are areas that are going to have a lot more ability to supply nutrients. With an organic matter of 3%, more nutrients and water will be able to hang around, but this outlier at less than 1% will have to spoon feed nutrients to that soil, especially when you see that it's also a very light soil in terms of CEC. It's probably going to have a high percentage of sand and it's probably not going to hold nutrients very well, nor is it going to have much being supplied from its organic matter. We see quite often that a low CEC like that will have a lot of sand in it. We'll also see it will also have a very low organic matter. Sands have very large pores between 
the particles that allow a lot of oxygen into the soil, and that speeds up the process of mineralization that happens on that organic matter. Light soils or low CEC soils won't build organic matter very easily either and burn off a lot of what organic matter it did have or stover that has been added over the years. After looking at cation exchange capacity and organic matter, we'll take a look at soil pH. There are two pH numbers on the soil test that sometimes create a lot of confusion. The soil pH uses a one-to-one -one ratio of soil with distilled, deionized water. Then we put a pH probe in the solution and measure that pH. You need to know what pH works best for the crops that you're working with. But a lot of times, for example, on corn and soybeans, they like something in that 6.5 to 6.2 range. If dealing with another crop, for example, like alfalfa, sometimes a slightly higher pH, like a 6.8 to a 7.5 is a great range to be in. As you deal with crops, understanding what the ideal pH range for that crop is very important. Maybe they will like a lower pH environment. If you can get to that lower pH environment, you truly want to be there for the crop to reach its full potential. Blueberries are just an example. They like that lower pH environment. On the other hand, the buffer index is looking at your soil as we mix it with a known pH, a highly buffered solution. Then we look at the change in that solution's pH when we add your soil to it. So starting with the soil pH here on the examples shown, several of the samples could use some liming. As you look at the first couple, we've got the pH in that 5.6 to 5.7 area. For corn and soybeans, for example, we would like to see that to be more around the 6.5. So we would certainly make a lime recommendation in that scenario. Here we get a soil with a pH at 6.6 .6 already. So not a lot of need for additional lime, but maybe you would wanna make a small application or maybe even Lime to try and keep that pH in that range that you're in already. We know adding fertilizer, especially nitrogen fertilizers, they add hydrogen to that soil and that additional hydrogen, of course, increases the acidity. That's what we're measuring when we're measuring for soil pH is that free hydrogen in the soil that a lot of the time is going to come from fertilizer applications. As we go down the rest of these samples, the Central Iowa at 6.3 the Eastern Nebraska sample at 6.4. In that range, we'd like it to be up again, but a small application of line just to keep them there, knowing as you were to add fertilizer, especially nitrogen fertilizer, you're going to bring that pH down and increasing the acidity with additional hydrogen coming from that fertilizer application. The one here in Northeast Nebraska, which again is the one with a very light CEC, is at a six and maybe we would say that's on the lower edge of where we want to be for a corn and soybean rotation. We know that additional fertilizer application is probably more likely to move this pH down quicker because it has less buffering capacity against those pH moves that would come from the cation exchange capacity and its overall nutrient holding abilities. Again, additional hydrogen with some additional fertilizers is probably gonna bring this one down here more rapidly than other soils. Also, in this example, we have a high pH soil with an 8.3 reading. Higher pH soils can also be difficult to grow some crops in, and you may run into some issues with nutrient tie-up, especially with nutrients like phosphorus and some of the micronutrients. But they can also be very productive soils, just depending on the intended crop. You'll want to understand some of those issues that you can have with those high pH soils. That's why we make that measurement so the proper management decisions can be made. Some of this will be dependent on your tillage. If you're practicing no-till, separate samples that are shallower are encouraged, encouraged to look at so we can get a good look at that pH in the top few inches of the soil environment where you might have a change and it's usually greater than what you see with an eight inch sample. That's something that a lot of growers that we work with will do. A separate sample will be taken at zero to three inches to check the pH and also a sample taken at that zero to six or zero to eight sample range where they would normally make their lime recommendations. When we move over to the buffer index, you will see here with a high pH soil, we do not 
have a buffer index because when pH is at or above that 6.8 or 6.9, we do not run the buffer. We assume that you will not be lining that soil to try and increase the soil pH. So no buffer is run, and that's the case with the 8.3 pH. As we look across these other soils, we have buffer indexes ranging from a low 6.5 to a high 6.9. Now, as I was talking to you earlier about how the buffer index can differ a lot based off of the pH of the soil, but also a lot can differ based off of the cation exchange capacity or the buffering capacity of that soil. We see a soil here with a pH of 6.3 a little lower and it's got a buffer index of 6.7. Here we see a soil pH of 6, which is significantly lower than the 6.3 and 6.4 soils above it. But the buffer index is actually higher than the two soils above it. And again, that has to do with that texture of the soil and its cation exchange capacity. The hydrogen that we're measuring with this pH of 6 overall in that soil is actually less than it is in the other two because again there is just less exchange sites so you know the hydrogen is bringing the ph down in the total amount of hydrogen or that reserve acidity that we need to crack with our line recommendation is actually less than the two soils above it and that's why we run the buffer index and we do not recommend that people make line recommendations solely based off of the soil pH, but instead use the soil pH as maybe a trigger to make the decision that yes, I do need the lime, but let the buffer pH be related to your actual recommendation. If you go to Iowa State's guide to lime recommendations and fertilizer recommendations, they would give you recommendations based off of these buffer indexes for actual lime applications or you can ask Midwest Laboratories for our recommendations. Again, soil pH is actually the pH of your soil. Say for a corn and soybean rotation, we sure would like to see that around 6.5 to around 7.2. Once you start running in the low sixes and certainly below six, you really should start thinking about making some lime applications, but when you go to make out the lime application, instead of just using the soil pH, you'd want to use the buffer index, which will take into consideration both free hydrogen that's in the soil, but also that reserve acidity that we will need to correct, which is related to the cation exchange capacity or the actual reserve hydrogen that is in the soil that we need to correct with the lime to make a cr true correction to the soil pH.